Hi, my name is Peter Neal and welcome to episode two on my new YouTube channel. Um, after last week's episode kind of about the panoramas, I wanted to, I guess, switch it up to something, I guess, a little more introductory and maybe helpful for people who are looking to get into music industry photography. Um, I think it's kind of my own take on what, having been through it the last number of years, what I feel are the most important skills that I've had to hone and develop. Um, and I guess if I was to go back in time, these are the things that I would tell myself to work on the most. Um, they're not all technical. Some of them are very much interpersonal, some of them are artistic, some of them are quite subjective. Some of them are gonna seem a little bit from left field, um, but I'm not gonna admit any of them because everyone comes from a different perspective. So the first one is knowing your camera inside and out. Um, extremely well. Like I used to work in weddings and weddings are not for the faint of heart. In fact, the reason I stopped doing weddings was that the stress was driving me bonkers of doing wedding photography. So props to any of you that do that. But one thing I found moving into music industry photography is you have to work way faster than even you do in weddings. Not in a stressful way, but it's just that your subjects, generally in a wedding, I've yet to see a bride jumping off a drum kit. Could happen, but you know, there's, there's more variety of randomness um, in a gig um, than most weddings. So knowing your camera inside and out, knowing how to do your ISO, your aperture, your shutter speed, um, your metering, um, your focus modes, knowing all of those without having, to, without having to look really at the menus, to be honest with you. You need to be like a Jedi with it. It is something that makes a big difference because it's the less you have to think about for that kind of stuff, the more space in your brain you have to be creative. And the next one for me is knowing your lenses and their strengths and weaknesses. So in another episode, I'm gonna be going through, I think what for me are my must have lenses in the pit, but whatever your gear is, um, you need to know what it's capable of and what it's not. Um, a classic example for me was um, many years ago, I had a Canon 50mm 1.4, great lens, wonderful lens but I would never use it wide open at 1.4 because it was always so soft, um, way too soft. It just felt that everything felt just that tight, tiny bit out of focus. But then I had a second one and I had exactly the same issue. Um, and I kind of realized it was just the consistency of the design of that particular lens. Other lenses, um, I have an 85 mil, for instance, 1.4, Sony uh, G Master now, and they are super sharp at their widest aperture. So it's just been, a, it's, it's worth being aware that of what your lens is capable of at its widest aperture. I say widest is that sometimes if you were at a really lowly lit gig and you'd like a very shallow depth of field for artistic purposes or just for, at a necessity's sake, it's nice to know how far you can push that gear. Um, and ultimately a lot of this stuff, you have only one chance to capture it. So it would be a real pain if you kind of overestimated the abilities of your lens when you could have just stopped down a little and suddenly uh, you'd have had a sharper image. The next thing is understanding histograms and making sure that you can just glance at them. Um, again, this is something that we will tackle in another episode, but I really am giving an overview on things that I find are enormously helpful for me in the pit. Um, being able to glance at histograms, I'll tell you why that's important. If you're switching between looking at super bright lights on stage or super, super dark light, lights on stage, whatever the case may be, and then into your camera and back out, your eyes take time to adjust. And the older you get, the longer they take to adjust. Uh, and looking at, for instance, an image preview in the back of the, your camera or in the viewfinder, you might not pick up the nuances of the exposure, particularly when it's small in the viewfinder, for instance, um, and be able to tell that you know, that there are significant portions of the image which are maybe slightly overexposed. Having a histogram and being able to see if any of it is kind of stacking up against that right-hand side of the chart will give you that knowledge so that when you're not sure with your eye, you can at least be sure with the digital stats in front of you. Depending on your model, I know with my, uh, with my cameras, I can just flick it on and whether it be the viewfinder or the back of the screen in real time, and it's great to have that. Um, or, but even if it's a case of just so you know how to do it if you're reviewing an image in the back of your camera and you know how to turn it on quickly so you can check it, then do that. And the next one is anticipation. Now, this is exceedingly less technical than the last couple of ones I've talked about, but anticipation is more of a hack in music industry photography and there's a lot of ways to do it. 
One of them is knowing the music. And if a good performer will use the cues that are already present in their music to tie their performance to. So even if it's a band you're seeing for the first time, uh, but you've heard their music before, the, the music will often give you a hint of when something dramatic might be coming. So at least you're kind of ready for it if you haven't had the chance to do any other prep. But there are other hacks as well, like if it's my first time shooting with a band and uh, I know that they've already been on tour, the fact is that fans put everything on YouTube these days, which is amazing. Whether it be Twitter or TikTok or whatever, there's such a variety of places to go and look and get footage of the gig. Particularly, it's quite easy to find out what the first three songs are, whether it be someone posts a picture of the set list or the fans are just discussing it on Twitter. You can get a good idea of those moments that are going to happen in that, in that event, which is the first time you shot a given gig. Um, if you've only got three song pass, that's going to give you a, a kind of a leg up because if there's 10 other photographers in the pit and for one particular moment, maybe the bass player comes to the edge of the stage and all of the other nine photographers run over to capture that moment, you might be the one who holds exactly where you are because you know the lead singer is going to sit down at the edge of the stage out towards the crowd and suddenly you get that like really intimate moment and you might be the only one who gets it. So yeah, anticipation isn't just a skill and telling what's going to happen. It can be a hack where you've put the research in to make the difference and give you a chance to stand out, um, which you wouldn't have had otherwise. The next one is slightly more, uh, I guess, artistic, and it's about composition. Um, I don't subscribe to hard and fast rules. I believe that there is a place for things like the rule of thirds but they are guidelines and they're certainly not universal. Um, sometimes it's a case really of just thinking what, what feels right when you look at an image. Um, we all walk around the height that we are, but especially as adults, we've been the height that we are for many years in some cases, and maybe we're shrinking. But the point being is that we generally hold our camera the same way, at the same height. And if we meet another photographer who's either a foot taller than us or a foot shorter, they have a, a different default perspective. And it's very important to remember to try and not be confined by your default. And that might mean scooting back on the ground or it might be um, with a super wide angle lens when the lead singer is leading out front of the pit, practically, practically getting on the, on the ground and leaning backwards. So you get their arms out over the crowd and you can see the crowd as well reaching out towards the singer. Um, or it could be simply, um, you know, manually setting the focus distance and reaching, you know, reaching out to an angle that you can't specifically stand at. Maybe you're at one side of the stage and depending on the scenario, um, getting a shot with the camera technically hovering a foot above the stage. Um, again, those are scenarios which are subjective, depend whether or not you're working for the band or whether uh, there's equipment that's in the way. So, but what I'm trying to get at is, is being willing to experiment and also be even, just as regards even just interesting angles, using the lights as part of the composition. I often treat the lights as much of a, as a subject in the same way as the actual lead singer or drummer or bass player or whatever the case may be. Treat them as subjects of the composition. You know, we don't have to be defined um, by either straight up or straight across. We, when we walk around the world, we don't either stand like this or like that. As we're observing something, if you're walking around a monument in a museum, your head will turn to all sorts of different angles as you inspect it. So really, if, we're, if we want to convey what it's like for people to be there, we need to almost treat our cameras as if they're something more organic and human uh, rather than something that's either 90 degrees or 180. Um, the next one, is loving limitations. Um, that sounds bizarre, but for me, limitations are the kind of the beginning of what gave me any sense of composition. Um, in 2007, before I got into professional photography, I had a Canon 350D digital and um, I think it was eight megapixel camera, could have been four, I think it was eight, anyway, it's irrelevant. But it was a crop sensor camera, and I had the 18 to 55 mil lens that came with it. 
and all my pictures are very much to zoom in and click, zoom out and click. No real work put into it. And I went on holiday with my wife to San Francisco and I bought my first Prime. It was an 85 mil 1.8. I bought it with very little knowledge of what I was buying, uh, to be honest with you, and um, put it on the camera. And obviously on a crop sensor camera, 85 mil 1.8, uh, the 85 multiplied by 1.6 meant that it was really quite a tight focal length. And we were in San Francisco for two weeks and I left it on the camera the whole time. And all the typical holiday pictures, including the ones where I was trying to get my wife in shot with such and such a monument, whatever the case may be, were with that lens. And I end up having to go back into like quite far back from her or into bizarre con contorted positions in order to get the shot. And the weird thing that happened was that when I came home, weird as it was, weird as a lot of the images actually were, but I came back and I actually discovered that I had a sense of composition that I'd never had because I hadn't done any of that zoom and click. I had been forced to think about every single shot. And without realizing that I had trained myself and I had given myself a tool that initially got me into wedding photography, which never went, never, don't get me wrong, I, I mentioned earlier hating it. I never had a wedding go wrong and I met some wonderful people through it who are still friends, including clients who are still close friends. But I think it stressed me out to the degree of how much I had a control I was, you know, whether it be weather or a groomsman who went off drinking and disappeared. There was all these things I was aware I could be blamed for that I had no control over. Anyway, I digress. But that gave me a sense of composition that first got me into wedding photography and then when I left that behind, got me into music industry photography. Now, I always have, like for instance, a 24 to 70 in the bag. I mean, I'm carrying two cameras. It's normally on one of those cameras, but I don't rely on being able to zoom and click. There are times when it's fantastically useful when something unexpected happens to be able to zoom and click when you haven't got an appropriate lens on the other camera, but it's not something that is my default. If you have a camera and you're looking to get into concert photography or you're just looking to increase your photographic skill, if you feel that your composition skills could improve, and to be honest, everyone's can, including my own, it's a constantly evolving thing, I would say limit yourself and say, I'm only gonna use this lens this week. It might feel frustrating, particularly if you're photographing something cool and you think, oh, I wish I had that super wide lens. Or I honestly feel that necessity is a mother of invention, but it's also the mother of creativity. And I guess creativity and invention are the same thing. So there you go. The next one is definitely learning from mistakes. It's very easy when you are, if you find there's a particular type of shot that you're good at to do just that shot, and, but you can end up becoming like a, a one trick pony. Um, it's good also to go after the things that you find super difficult and keep trying them even when it's very frustrating where you can't get a particular type of shot and you see this other photographer who you know, who you have a friendly rivalry with who can always get this particular type of shot. It's good to just keep pushing yourself and learn from the mistakes and don't be afraid or too proud to ask somebody how you do something. Like I still do it. There are times when I, I will talk to another photographer and say, um, you know that shot? How, how did you get that? Because everyone has their own approach to what they've learned and people discover things that other people don't. It's just the way it is. This next one, and certainly um, we're getting, I guess, towards the end of the list for what I would regard as essential skills, but I regroup them together as soft skills. They have every bit as much impact, if not more, on the end result of your photography. So if I get to a venue, uh, for argument's sake, say it's a band that I've not worked with before, and um, I'm maybe I might be working at a venue that I haven't worked at before, with a security team that I don't know. So I'll go into the venue, um, go and get my pass, if they don't have the right one, I think the key is, this is the first hurdle and the first place not to fall over is remember to be super polite and helpful and patient, even if somebody has messed up and your pass isn't where it was supposed to be. Um, just at the end of the day, uh, it makes the world a difference to actually set the right first impression. Once you get over whatever that hurdle is, and hopefully it's not too big a one, um, go to whoever you've been told to meet, whether it be the tour manager or the production manager or stage manager, or whoever you're kind of sent to is your first point of contact. Go in there with very much an attitude that they may have had, I'm not saying they have, but they may have be wary of you as someone, you're an unknown entity in their well-oiled machine. 
which has been running for the previous 30 nights and suddenly you come along and you're an unknown variable and you have to realize that that can make them nervous when so much money has been spent on running that gig or maybe there's people from the label down or maybe their senior in the structure is you know going to be at the gig that night so you need to make sure that they know that you're listening but you also need to convey to them that you take their rules seriously and um, that you you ultimately are there to capture but not get in the way and not take away from the show. Um, it's very important that you give that impression. Um, if you give that impression, it does open doors, not only for things that you might ask to do during the gig. Like for instance, you might not have been asked to jump on the stage at the end of the gig and get a picture behind the band as they bow. But if you've demonstrated that attitude during maybe the three or four hours you're there before the gig, covering sound check and whatever the case may be, um, if you demonstrate a good attitude during that time, when you, an hour before the show, ask if you can you know, hop on the back of the stage and get that shot, you're much more likely to get a yes, quite frankly, having demonstrated that. Um, after meeting them, I tend to go and ask if I can just be brought to where the head of security is. Or, depending on the venue, if I know where they're going to be, I'll just go there myself. And I'll introduce myself to the security team, let them know that I'm there working with the band, they can make sure that the pass that I have on is the right one. If it's not, they can feed back to me and I can go back to the, the production manager. Um, by, that, I'm sh by doing that, I'm showing them respect. And then that pays dividends because at the end of the day, they're going to help you out. They're going to move for you if they realize they're in your way trying to get a specific shot if you've taken the time to respect them first. So I would regard that as a critical thing to do. Um, the next thing I always do is I go and visit the uh, person who's in control of the lighting and I ask them what are, the, what are the high points of the show from their perspective. I always have a copy of the set list at this point and um, you know, lighting, lighting technicians and designers l love, and rightly so, love sh talking about their craft and um, getting their perspective on the biggest, most dynamic and most interesting moments was a huge advantage for you. Um, and it means you can plan your position, um, but it also means that potentially you might actually be making yourself a client because, because that light lighting technician might want to hire you to work uh, with them, with another artist, maybe to get some pictures for their own website. Then after doing that, I kind of go back to someone I've already been chatting to in security. I'll ask them for, you know, what in your opinion is the quickest route between front of house and the stage? and they'll put, you know, they'll point me in the direction potentially. Uh, if they don't know, I'll just go and explore and figure that out myself. All the routes of the venue between trying to get from, say, the dressing rooms to the stage to uh, front of house to the back middle of the venue. Um, and all equally on the way at those key points, say there's a wonderful spot that you know you want to come back to later. Normally an hour or two before the gig, the security person is going to be on site in that location. So make sure you introduce yourself to them too. All of these things could also prevent you from being kicked out of a venue. Uh, that has happened to me before. And the important thing, uh, it, it's been kicked, it's normal, in fact, it's always been because somebody who maybe who wasn't in the security briefing didn't get the note that I, that I was coming. And it also that I hadn't happened, you can't tap chat to every security person, but it was someone who, you know, just, it wasn't on their radar that I was gonna be there. And they said, you're not supposed to be here, uh, go out there and I'll make, and I'll call someone on my radio. The important thing is, if they tell you to move and go out into the hallway, you do it. You don't argue with them. It's a waste of time arguing on the spot. And the point of arguing on the spot with them, that is just the, all the justification they need to kick you out and potentially not get the shots that you have been there, paid there to get. You are much better off just moving out, chat to them in the corridor, and they can then, if you already know the name of somebody back a house who knows you're supposed to be there, whether it be their supervisor who you've met earlier in the day, or whether it be the production manager who's backstage and who they can radio as well. So yeah, it's, you have to know, pick your battles of which ones to win and which ones to lose briefly in the hope that you can win the overall battle and get back in. I'm going to just run through some other skills which are very good to focus on. One of them uh, would be knowing how to do basic video with your camera. Uh, most photographers these days know how to uh, do a certain amount of video with their camera because their clients will often ask them, 
you know, would you mind switching to video for song four and record that song from the pit or from the right of the pit or from the side of the stage, whatever the case may be, um, and then give them the files after. It's a thing that's expected to be able to do that now. The mistake where a lot of people fall up on is not knowing some of the more slightly more advanced functions that make your end product phenomenally better. So one question you should ask when you get asked to do video is what frame rate do you want it at? Uh, because at the end of the day, if it's an existing project that they're working on, um, and if it's, sh if it's 25 frames per second or 30 or 29.97 or 24, um, it's good to match it. And whoever's editing it is going to thank you for it. And it's going to be end up being more useful to them. Second of all is if your camera supports it, knowing how to shoot in log in order to get fl a flat footage that can be graded much more easily. This is phenomenally useful. It means apart from anything else, your highlights and shadows will, will be yeah, in the kind of gig environment will be will come out a lot better with a lot less blow and highlights. Um, but there'll be a lot less kind of blow and banding and horrible contrast around bright lights. And it means that if they if the rest of whatever they're shooting for instance, it's been shot with a very high end, like, I don't know, Ari Alexa or something like that. The footage from your camera is going to sit beside it a lot better than it would have. And it's going to be a lot more useful to them. Uh, very often recording sound in your camera at a gig, it's often not really necessary as anything other than guide audio, because very often they're actually recording um, a multi-track recording from the sound desk. However, there are occasions for smaller gigs and for smaller artists, they do want that you know, audio from the camera. And it's worth considering having something like a Rode hot shoe microphone or the like attached to your camera for those scenarios, or at least in your camera bag that you can pull out and just get a bit, a bit better audio. Because often the mic in the camera body itself will pick up um, your movements uh, quite a lot and like your hands on the camera body and that will interfere with the quality of the sound um, quite a bit. So that pretty much, I guess, wraps up my summary of the, the important skills for working on the day at a, at a venue. There's a whole other topic, which is, I guess, working in something in post and all the stuff you do with those files after you get home. And that's definitely for a topic for another video. But after having done that panoramas talk last week, I just wanted just to do a video about kind of the main skills as far as I see them in music related photography and as such um, maybe some of these things you can work on during this worldwide time of lockdown um, but yeah thank you for tuning in i hope it's been interesting i hope it's been useful please subscribe that would be awesome and yeah ask questions as many as you want i will be answering questions in the comments and you can see my username on screen to follow me on various different platforms thank you very much appreciate it oh quick extra um, you may have noticed I actually have a theme tune this week and not this like deathly scary sound that I had in episode one. I'm not sure what I was thinking. Anyway, it's thanks to Jimbo Barry who kindly knocked this piece up for me. Um, and some of you will know him as a producer and songwriter with the script. Thank you, Jimbo, you legend. <laughs>